Yeah. Thanks so much for being here. So yeah, I will talk about an interesting and maybe surprising psychological phenomenon called dysrationalia. And dysrationalia is defined as um, the inability to think rationally despite having adequate intelligence. Now here's an outline of my talk. <clears throat> I will first introduce the topic and define the terms, in particular intelligence and rationality. And then I will um, we'll have a closer look at um, why rationality is important and the cognitive psychology of rationality and irrationality, and different sources of how irrational thinking and uh, decision making can come about. And um, by doing so, we are in a better position to judge to which extent we can improve um, our rationality and uh, what the implications are for society. So I'll start with the following quote. I'm also not very analytical. You know, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about myself about why I do things. So this quote is actually by former US President George Bush. <laughs> and um, it, it probably represents general patterns in his thinking style, which um, a lot of people, I would say, quickly after he became president realized yeah, it's, may, it's maybe suboptimal in, in many ways. And um, if we were to analyze from a cognitive uh, psychological point of view the, the suboptimal thinking patterns of George Bush, we could come up with a list, such as the following one, lack of intellectual engagement, cognitive inflexibility, need for closure, belief perseverance, confirmation bias, overconfidence, insensitivity to inconsistency, etc. <clears throat> so. Both opponents and, um, opponents and proponents of the former US president were very surprised when it was revealed that Bush is actually very intelligent. He has an IQ score of 120, which is more than a standard de deviation above the average. Um, so and how can we explain this? How can Bush be so intelligent on the one hand, but clearly lacking very important um, cognitive aspects? And, and the reason is that um, important cognitive aspects of good thinking are not captured by IQ tests, such as the one uh, in this list here. Yeah, and this is surprising because <clears throat> we usually assume that good thinking is the equivalent of intelligence. Um, somebody who's good at thinking should have a high IQ score, and somebody who's bad at thinking should have a low IQ score. And um, whether we like it or not, intelligence actually plays a really important role in our society. It basically determines our careers and um, our professional careers and our academic careers. University admissions um, rely on intelligence tests, either explicit ones or proxies, such as the SIT test, for example. And like all parents want to have children with high IQ, etc. So we really put a lot of emphasis on intelligence. So what exactly do we mean by intelligence? So here in this talk, um, I'm not talking about intelligence in the sense of artificial intelligence, how Casper defined it in the previous talk, but I will just talk about the psychological construct of intelligence. And for the sake of, of this argument and during this talk, I will just define intelligence as what IQ tests measure. Um, so IQ tests basically measure um, cognitive capacity, namely how fast you are at thinking, um, how fast you are at recognizing patterns, how, uh, the efficiency of your memory, etc. And of course, these are important cognitive aspects, and they predict uh, a lot of important uh, behavioral patterns. But um, they're not, this is not identical to rationality. Um, so IQ tests don't really measure explicitly um, rationality as defined by cognitive science. And cognitive scientists um, define rationality as being able to form accurate beliefs and to make right decisions in order to achieve your goal, whatever your goal is. So rationality is goal neutral. Um, and now every systematic deviation in your thinking or deciding from these uh, models, from epistemic rationality and instrumental rationality, are by definition cognitive biases. So sy systematic thinking patterns that um, will lead us to be worse at achieving our goal, what we care about. And now. Um, there has been a lot of research over the last three decades on cognitive biases in behavioral economics or in cognitive psychology, and a lot of biases have been discovered. So we all show a huge amount of biases, dozens or hundreds of biases, and interestingly or weirdly, 
this line of research on cognitive biases has been uh, completely separate from the research on in the psychology of in, on intelligence, and in particular the assessment of intelligence. So, um, important cognitive aspects of rational thinking that are neglected, uh, are not captured by IQ tests, are, for example, the following. Uh, being able to generate alternative hypotheses, to uh, being able to reflect on your goal, hypothetical reasoning, actively open-minded thinking, being able and willing to change your opinion in the light of new evidence. So these are important um, aspects of good thinking, of rationality, that are not captured by IQ tests. So as we see, both conceptually and empirically, intelligence is not the same as rationality, psychologically. So an IQ score is not the equivalent of a hypothetical RQ score, so a rationality quotient score. And unfortunately, there's no test yet that measures rationality reliably, but there are researchers who are working on this. And one of them is cognitive psychologist uh, Keith Stanovich, um, who um, is doing really fascinating work on these topics, and I can really recommend um, to uh, look into his work, and many of the points that I'm making in this talk are based on, on his research. And so even though there's no explicit RQ test yet, there are proxies um, to measure RQ. Um, so for example, there are a lot of tests that measure to which extent people fall prey to certain biases or, um, or whether they're able to overcome these biases. And these tests, these battery sets of tests can be used as proxies for, uh, to measure RQ. And Stanovich and his colleagues have found that in fact there's only a very weak correlation. So there is a positive, a significant correlation but only a weak correlation between IQ and RQ. And in fact, for some biases, there is no correlation at all, or maybe sometimes even a slight negative one. So much more research, of course, is needed here. But for example, um, um, Sanovich found that there is no correlation, or maybe even a slight negative correlation, between intelligence and the ability uh, to overcome confirmation bias. So the tendency to only seek out for information or evidence that will confirm the opinion or hypothesis that you already hold. And maybe the reason is that um, if you're more intelligent, you're faster and better able to detect um, information or evidence that supports the view that you already hold. And as a result, will make you more prone to rationalize your opinions. So um, because of this dissociation between IQ and RQ, it's possible that there are people who have a high IQ but a low RQ. And this is called dysrationalia. And yeah, Bush might be an example of somebody uh, who is this rationalic, um, and probably you have met such people as well, so maybe you know of people who are actually really intelligent and really good at what they do, but um, when it comes, comes to certain topics, for example, when you talk with them about EA or about moral philosophy, you will realize that maybe they're really stubborn and not really willing to change their mind, even though their objections seem totally inconsistent with the premises that they usually hold, and if this is the case, maybe um, you're talking to somebody who would classify as being dysrationalic. Um, so having a high IQ with a low RQ. <clears throat> so why is rationality important? Um, firstly, um, this is maybe almost a trivial point. Um, for it, rationality really is important for everybody, by definition, because rationality is about achieving what you care about in the most effective way possible. So whether you want to get as rich as possible or be as happy as possible, or whether you just want to live a normal, relaxed life, whatever you care about, it pays for you to be more rational, to avoid biases, because by doing so, you will be more able to systematically achieve what you care about. But now, um, for the context of this conference, maybe particularly important is the question of to which extent rationality plays an important role in a moral context. Because, yeah, I would, I would argue that probably Many people hold broadly altruistic goal under reflection. Many people care about others and are, at least to some extent, altruistic. And even though biases were originally investigated um, in the context of selfish or economic decision-making context, of course, they also play a role in altruistic or moral decision-making context. And arguably, they're even much more important here because much more is at stake. Because here, we're not talking about money, but about human lives or animal lives who are at stake. And unfortunately, irrationality literally kills. So 
Um, I don't need to tell you that when it comes to the charitable giving context, for example, people make um, a very make often very unreflected decisions. They donate to ineffective charities, even though on the reflection they would realize probably that it would be better to donate to effective charity, and um, by doing so they would be able to save more, many more lives counterfactually. And of course there are a, a number of biases that we could um, investigate to, to find out why people make these wrong decisions. Um, another example is our tendency to not care about non-human animals and to exploit them in large numbers. And this might also be the re results of several biases. Um, similarly, when it comes to future generations, we have diminished moral concerns for, diminished moral concern for people who live in the future or in the far future. And there are probably also um, a number of biases who, will play, who might play a role in this context. Okay, so let's have a closer look at the cognitive psychology of rationality. What exactly is rationality or irrationality cognitively? How can we explain it? What are sources of irrational thinking and decision making? According to Keith Stanovich, there are three sources of irrational thinking and decision making. The first one is cognitive miserliness. And by this, um, is meant the following. So we are all lazy thinkers. Um, as a default, we don't want to put too much resources into thinking because it's effortful. And this is why, as a default, we think in so-called system one mode of thinking. And this mode of thinking is characterized by a fast, intuitive, and effortless um, type of thinking, basically our gut reactions. But we can also switch to a system two mode of thinking, which is characterized by a slower and more deliberate kind of reasoning. But it's much more effortful. And now, usually um, it's okay to rely on your gut reactions, on your system one reactions, because the responses, the answers that our gut reactions uh, yield are actually um, quite good. But still it happens quite often that we are faced uh, with a situation or with a problem that we need to solve where our system one reactions are just wrong. And in these cases, it's important to switch to system two and put more effort into thinking to work out what the right solution is and overcome your first gut reaction. And I would say that in particular, in complex moral situation, this is often the case. And now, what often happens is that um, we should switch to system two because our system one reaction is not reliable, but we don't do so because we're too lazy. And this is the source of many biases and can explain a huge number of biases. So in the moral context, an example is the identifiable victim effect which is a bias that um, is defined as our, as our tendency to be more willing um, to help a single identifiable person whose name we know, whose story we know, who we maybe see on a photo or uh, we know personally, um, compared to a large, a large number of people who we don't really know, who are not really identifiable. Maybe we just see the statistics um, of how many they are. And there are a number of studies which show that, for example, in the charitable giving context, people often are more willing to donate and they donate more to an identifiable victim than to a larger number of people. And here now, given this framework, I think we can explain what is going on uh, because as a default, of course, we think in system one and our gut reaction because we are very emotional when we see or think about this identifiable person is to just help this person. But, but then we can switch to system two and then we realize that actually it's important to take the numbers into account because of course, behind every single number, there's an individual person who matters equally, and we could, of course, also identify them if we had enough time. And just because they're not ident identifiable, it's not that they matter less. So that would be an example of um, cognitive miserliness in the moral decision-making context. A second source of irrationality is, or are so-called mindware gaps. And mindware is, analogous to software, but for the mind. So algorithms, processes, um, cognitive procedures, and thinking tools that we can acquire, similarly to how we can install software. Um, and usually this mindware or um, these thinking tools are procedures that we are not equipped with when uh, at birth. So we actually have to deliberately learn it. And an example of mindware is probabilistic reasoning which is just um, a really important thinking tool 
that doesn't really come intuitive and we have to learn about it. And for a long time during history, humanity didn't know about it at all. But it's just crucial to understand the world and the structure of the world in order to make the right decisions. Um, so yeah, for example, we might be faced with either donating to one charity where we can save one person for sure, or to another charity where we can save two people only with a 60% probability. And in these situations, um, it's important to switch to system two because our gut reactions are just totally unreliable. But then when you switch to system two, you also need to have the right mindware. And if you don't have them, then you're still not able to figure out the right answer. And in this, for example, with this example, you need to know about probabilistic reasoning, uh, probability theory and expected value theory, and otherwise, uh, yeah, it doesn't help you to switch to system two because you still cannot answer the question. Uh, a third source of bias is a particularly tra tragic one, namely when you switch to system two and activate mindware, but then you activate mindware that's unhelpful. Maybe because it's just wrong, it's based on wrong premises, um, or it's just not helpful in this specific context. And examples are superstitious thinking or pseudoscience or um, belief in folk psychology, for example. And of course, it's important to try to avoid unhelpful mindware. So now that we have a better understanding of the cognitive psychology of rationality and how irrational thinking patterns can emerge, we are in a position to judge uh, whether rationality can be learned. And Interestingly, in comparison to in intelligence, it seems, um, which is much, more, uh, much less flexible because it's to a large extent genetically determined, rationality can be learned. Um, so this is maybe to some extent a controversial claim because there is not that much research yet, but I believe that the research that already exists seems to suggest that this is the case and it also seems, uh, it seems quite obvious to me that, that rationality can be learned, at least to a much larger extent than intelligence. Um, and I will talk about three methods of teaching or learning rationality. And these are knowledge about biases, debiasing techniques, and acquiring mindware. So knowledge about biases. Um, several studies have shown that um, just by making people aware of the fact that they are prone to uh, certain biases already diminishes these biases. So for example, this works for framing effects hindsight bias or the outcome effect, or to anchoring to some extent. So I will not explain these biases in greater detail, but um, you can all look them up on, on Wikipedia and there. So if you type into Wikipedia a list of cognitive biases, you will find a huge list of, of hundreds of biases or dozens of biases. And uh, you'll probably recognize a lot of biases that you yourself might have. Um, now, there are also biases that cannot be avoided just by being aware of them. For example, overconfidence. Um, so whether we inform people about their tendency to be overconfident in their abilities or not is not going to have an impact on how overconfident they are. So people just are not able to learn that they're not as good as they actually are. And um, this is important to know, of course, because then for some biases it works, but not for others. And it's important to know for which one it does and for which one it doesn't. Uh, another technique or another method of um, becoming more rational is um, the application of debiasing techniques. Debiasing techniques are techniques or heuristics that we can use in situations where we expect us to be biased, um, or in situations uh, or decision problems that we need to solve, which are really important, such as important life decisions, for example, and yeah, where we just want to re really make sure that we are not falling prey to certain biases. And the first debiasing technique is called thinking the opposite. And this is really a straightforward technique. It basically just asks you to always consider the opposite, to consider the alternative hypothesis, for example. And just by triggering this in your thought, um, yeah, you're able to overcome um, certain biases. For example, you're, um, it makes you more likely to overcome the confirmation bias, or the omission bias, or the status quo bias. And in general, it, it, it triggers you to think more in terms of opportunity costs of your actions. And it has been shown that this technique even works for children or for people with low IQ. Um, and in the context of EA, um, this technique, for example, will, would help us to also consider alternative causes, other causes that we haven't really thought of, instead of just 
focusing on, on the cause that we uh, currently put all our efforts in. Now, another technique is called take the outside view. This technique asks you to um, view your situation that you are right now from a third uh, person point of view. And this will help you to think more objectively about the problem that you need to solve and to minimize or to eliminate um, several biases or preferences that might affect you in this current situation. And um, it has been shown that this works, for example, to avoid planning fallacy or to minimize planning fallacy. So, um, for example, um, when you're working on a project or when you're organizing a conference, um, people usually are extremely bad at estimating the amount of time or, or effort it takes them. It usually it takes them much longer and, and needs much more, uh, you need much more resources to complete the project. And this is really a strong bias. Like almost everybody has it and to really a large extent. And it has been shown that, yeah, if you think about this from a third person point of view, so if you, for example, ask, well, how long would it take this person here to uh, organize this conference? Then people are much better uh, at estimating how long it will take them. Um, another deep icing technique is notching. And notching is maybe, maybe one of the most effective ones, I would say. Um, so notching, um, the idea of notching is that you change the decisional environment or the decisional architecture in such a way so that people will more or less automatically choose the right option or behave or decide in a desirable way. And you can, this can be applied on a personal level or also on a group or so societal level. So an example for um, self-notching on a personal level um, would be the following. So assume, um, let's assume you want to become vegetarian or vegan, but you find it very difficult. And what you could do is you could just change your situation. You could move in uh, into a new flats with flatmates who are all vegan already. And this will just notch you to, uh, to be vegan yourself because it's much easier because they only buy vegan food and uh, they only cook vegan meals. And this would be a way of self-notching yourself. Uh, of notching yourself. Um, now, this also works on a group level. Um, for example, one way of notching that's extremely effective is to establish certain norms, so social norms. So in the EA movement, for example, we, we have this norm of donating 10% of your income. And yeah, I think this is really effective because new people who will join will also feel maybe the social pressure of, of, um, of doing so as well. And then it makes it much easier. Um, I actually, I conducted a study together with some colleagues in which we were um, investigating the default bias. The default bias is, the t is our tendency to just choose the default option instead of a non-default option. And we wanted to see whether we can use the default bias um, to make people donate more to effective charities. And um, this, of course, is also a way of notching by setting default. Um, so what we did is participants had to complete a number of tasks that were unrelated. And then at the very end, we just asked them whether they uh, would be willing to donate a certain amount of their payment to effective charities. And then for half of the participants, this um, this option was already ticked on. So the checkbox on the screen was already ticked on. And for the other half, it wasn't ticked on. And you had to click on it um, actively. And actually, the, the, the difference is really uh, is striking. So in the non-default group, only 20% donated. And in the default group, 80% donated. So it's a really strong effect size. Um, and, so it, and it's, of course, extremely simple to uh, just change the defaults. Now, the third method of teaching rationality is to teach mindware. So as we already discussed before, mindware is crucial to think uh, and decide in a rational way. And some examples of important mindware are um, scientific reasoning. So um, knowing what an experiment is and uh, that it's important to have large sample sizes, that you need to have random allocation between groups, uh, that correlation is not the same as causation, etc. This is just, this is just really important. These are really important um, thinking tools or ways of thinking that, that you need in order to understand how the world works and uh, what the structure of the world is. Um, another important mind word that we already discussed is probabilistic reasoning uh, or decision uh, or insight into decision theory or a basic understanding of game theory can be really useful. Um, economic reasoning um, is extremely important. So thinking in terms of opportunity costs or um, in terms of exponential functions, for example. These are all, to a large extent, very counterintuitive ways of thinking, but they're just really important. 
um, logic, of course, and yeah, of course, um, the ability to overcome unhelpful mindware. So a last point or question I want to raise is whether improving rationality is actually desirable. Um, whether rationality is actually going to make people more altruistic. Because um, of course, as, I, um, as we discussed before, rationality is goal neutral in theory. So um, whether um, if you Im improve rationality, in theory at least, you're not really going to change people's values at all you're just going to make them better at whatever they already care about. And of course, we don't really want to make psychopaths more effective at achieving their psychopathic goal. We want altruists to be more effective and to be more rational. So at least in theory, rationality and values are completely orthogonal. However, of course, it's much more complicated when we talk about our psychology. And if you make people more rational, they're maybe also going to change their values. So this is, of course, an empirical question, ultimately. And I really don't know what the answer is. And seems extremely crucial to um, solve this question first bef bef uh, before we start to spread rationality in society. Um, yeah, as, read, as Adriano already mentioned in, in, in his opening speech, unfortunately, it seems to be the case that teaching economics can make people more selfish. And um, I looked into a few studies, and it actually really seems to be the case that this is not just a correlation, but actually a causation. Um, but I'm still cautious of how to interpret these results, because there are, of course, a lot of confounding factors here. And um, then also, economics is just a, a sub-part. Mindware of economics is a sub-aspect um, of, of rationality. And there are many other really important aspects. And um, yeah, I really don't know how, how to interpret this result. But it should make us cautious. Um, I would speculate that many aspects of rational thinking, such as open-mindedness, for example, are probably going to make people more altruistic, because it makes them more receptive to moral arguments, for example, which then, in turn, will make them more altruistic. And yeah, probably this was the case for many of us, many effective altruists. Yeah, this is also a really interesting perspective. Um, to, look, to, to try to answer this question from a, from a historical or sociological perspective, um, because if we look over, um, through history at how uh, humans became more rational and more altruistic over time, so over the millennia, centuries, and decades, um, yeah, then we can conclude that there's probably, at least on a social level, there's a correlation between rationality and altruism. And this would maybe be evidence in favor of the hypothesis that making people more rational is also going to make them more altruistic. But now maybe one could counter-argue and say, well, maybe our values are not actually much more altruistic. So um, we, we, we believe that this is the case because, yeah, so in the medieval times, for example, people had really horrible values, um, we believe. But today, we seem to have much better values. But maybe what is actually going on is that we just got better at solving cooperation problems. Uh, but maybe for purely selfish reasons. Maybe we just realized that it's not a good idea to start fights or to start wars, but maybe purely driven by selfish um, cooperation reasons. But yeah, so this is just a speculation. I have no idea what the right answer is. And uh, maybe we can talk about this later. OK, so to conclude, um, yeah, so we are facing really important um, global moral problems today. And um, we really cannot afford to make mistakes because so much is at stake. And that's why good thinking and good decision making is so crucial. And this is why, um, as I was trying to show in this talk, uh, we should really try to focus on the right type of good thinking. And even though intelligence, of course, is an important construct and predicts many important um, behavioral patterns, um, it's not the best proxy for good thinking. Instead, it should be rationality. And so we should be able to um, measure rationality, um, which will then allow us to select for it in society, in, in careers, professional careers, um, at, at the office for, of the US president, for example. This might be particularly important in these months. And then, of course, ultimately to improve it, if we believe that this is desirable. And yeah, I would argue that improving rationality in society will probably have a huge leverage effect, because by making people better at thinking and better at decision making, they will be better at solving 
a huge number of problems that they weren't able to solve before or not to such a good extent. And this is why uh, probably a lot of problems will be solved and we'll, this will have a huge leverage effect. Um, so concrete action points that we can do or that uh, we as a society uh, should pursue. So first, we need much more research, clearly, because this is just a, still a topic that's very much in its infancy in psychology. And yeah, we, I, I would say it's safe to say that we as effective altruists uh, should probably try to become more rational, and I believe that we can do so, probably to quite a large extent. I would speculate that you can just in your lifetime improve your RQ by several standard deviations, I would, I would speculate. Um, just by, yeah, by, by learning about biases and by reading important books uh, about biases and about the, the psychology of, of, of thinking and of cognitive biases and by acquiring mindware. Um, in fact, there's um, an effective altruist organization called CIFAR, Center for Applied Rationality, which is focusing on, uh, on this type of research and developing debiasing techniques and also trying to teach it to people. And we, um, the Effective Altruism Foundation, we are currently working on a policy paper on this topic. And we're, we are even considering proposing a school subject, um, rational thinking and ethics. But this is still um, in planning phase and uh, many things are open. But if you have ideas or inputs, please let me know and get in touch. So yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot, Lucius. That was very interesting. Right now, we have the time for about three questions, I guess. Over there. Yeah, thank you for your interesting talk. Um, I hope I do not sound like um, I'm trying to employ caveman tactics, but do you see any, change, uh, any chance, for instance, to employ also neuro enhancements uh, to improve rationality in the long term if education isn't a feasible option? Yeah, um, yeah, really interesting question. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I certainly think that this is a possibility. Um, but I, I, I believe that in, that in fact currently those neuro enhancing techniques that exist are not that effective because they only focus on very narrow cognitive aspects such as attention or memory and the effect sizes are really small. Um, I actually, I, I wrote a, a small paper on this topic and what I, um, my conclusion is that um, pharmacological uh, cognitive enhancers such as Ritalin or Modafinil or even caffeine are not more effective than uh, natural forms of cognitive enhancement such as just sleeping enough, eating healthy, uh, or uh, exercise in particular. And, um, but I do certainly believe that in theory, and hopefully if we think that it's desirable in the coming years or decades, um, there will be more effective ways of enhancing cognition. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's probably still extremely difficult. And maybe it's also the case that we're currently at a local optimum and that it will be really difficult to change our, uh, like, yeah, our, our brain in order to go directly from this local optimum to a next local optimum or to a global optimum without um, having uh, declines in, in our cognition. Um, as maybe, maybe we can talk about this later if you want. Yeah. <laughs> if rationality can be learned, would you think that rationality is cultural and the practical implication of rationality being something cultural is that you need, if you approach a community and you try to make them switch to the system too, you will have actually an intercultural dialogue. So, in order to be able to, to make this community to learn rationality, you will be able, you need to be able to teach rationality. And it's hard to do so if you come with the idea that you are approaching a community which is uh, irrational or superstitious. So what will be the, the problem with this intercultural dialogue? Mm -hmm. So the question is um, how we can make people more rational who currently are so irrational that maybe we just cannot make them more rational. Is this, is this the question? Or, 
Yeah, I'm not sure I understood it correctly, sorry. My question is that, first of all, uh -huh. is irrationality something cultural? Something what, sorry? Cultural. Cultural, sorry, yes. yeah. Um, oh yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would certainly say so to some extent because, um, yeah, I mean, it, if you look back in history, you know, people with other cultures, they were probably just much less rational uh, because, because they were just lacking really important insights in, our, um, in the psychology of our decision making and thinking. So if you think about it, the discovery of cognitive biases, which is just three to four decades old, is an extremely important discovery for humanity because it was the first time when we actually understood and like really deeply in a scientific way under, understand why and how and where we make cognitive um, errors. And of course you need, to, you need this understanding in order then to, uh, to improve your thinking. So yeah, basically if your culture is able to develop such important insights, then the culture is probably gonna be more rational. Yeah. Um, for my question, um, if I may, quick remark, I would find it natural that uh, rationality uh, increases altruism um, by um, um, going back to the uh, talk uh, by the second professor, <laughs> uh, because um, it uh, fulfills uh, a basic need of ours. And if we recognize that, it would be only uh, rational to be altruistic, you know. Um, yep. It's an uh, uh, effective uh, goal-reaching strategy for pretty much everyone because it's a universal need. It's a because universal you believe goal. that everyone is deep at, uh, uh, inside, they're actually altruistic. Yeah, because it makes you happy. And I mean, All right. whatever you do is probably oh, okay. for your All right. yeah, hedonistic but fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah. That's true, but there, for example, there are just 1% uh, of um, people are psychopaths. So these people... Um, yeah. Just they just literally they don't care about others. Right. They don't. They're just they have no empathy, and for those people, for example, their like, rationality will just make them more effective at achieving their self-interest goal. But I right. I would maybe agree right. probably that for a lot of people who are not psychopaths, yeah, not yeah, I, I, it's, it's right. my this is, I have the same intuition. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> can I can I post uh, the question anyway? Thanks. Um, so uh, I would be very interested if there is um, empirical rigorously scientific evidence for um, uh, spend that for the uh, assumption that spending time on epistemic rational rationality is actually instrumentally rational you know that, you, that it ex actually makes you better at reaching your goals yeah. and not just maybe distracts you from the actually important things maybe not thinking so much and just doing it or, or whatever you know so you're saying being more epistemically rational is also going to make you instrumentally more rational? That's the question. I mean, yeah. you're implying that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But is it, so is it proven? Um, proven? I'm not sure, but I think yes, it's a really interesting question because um, maybe even conceptually, instrumental rationality and epistemic rationality collapses. But I'm not sure about this, but I've been thinking about this. And, um, because in a, so epistemic rationality is about knowing the truth. It's about knowing what's correct and knowing how the world is and how it works. And instrumental rationality is about making the right decisions, right, to achieve your goal. But if you think about it, no, making the right decisions, of course, implies that you know how the world is correctly and that you know what your goal is and that you know which option you need to choose and what's going to happen when you choose the right option. So in fact, instrumental rationality maybe boils down to epistemic rationality as well. But you're, you're shaking your head, so you don't yeah, agree. Mm -hmm. you, might be, you might make better decisions by knowing that. Uh -huh, yes. For that. Oh, yeah. Um, sorry, may I interrupt yeah. here? Yeah. <laughs> you can take that discussion maybe Let's do to that, a later yeah. stage. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much.